Lost in Vivo is a deeply intense psychological horror game that released in 2018. I've heard about it before and seen the title on my Steam page several times, but I've clearly made a criminal mistake in not picking this game up until recently. This game never seemed to fully grasp the attention of the mainstream horror audience, as searching for content related to it only yields results from a handful of large creators, while most content surrounding it doesn't seem to crack more than a few thousand views. I don't think this video will get many views either, but this game is too special for me to not add my input into the pile. I think it's the peak of PSX style in psychological horror. I haven't played anything that comes close to instilling this level of fear and stress since this game came out. In terms of such feelings, I haven't been this scared and stressed while playing a video game since Visage. Lost in Vivo is built on the concept of facing your fears head on and it takes that idea in full stride. The concept not only applies to facing horrifying monsters and creatures, but also the barriers, constrictions, and difficulties of living with mental disorders. Specifically brought to the forefront in this game are claustrophobia, body dysmorphia, bulimia, severe depression, and psychosis. I think that the game portrays these disorders with tact and respect, while still creating a chilling experience to play through. So let's talk about it. I'm going to be giving a quick review analysis of the game, then we'll be taking a more in-depth look about how the game portrays mental disorders through gameplay. This video contains full spoilers. Welcome to the lab. This game does a fantastic job of blending horror, story, and gameplay together. Think of those elements as a sort of triangle, with horror being at the top, being connected to story and gameplay effectively. The story itself is ambiguous, though is connected to the framework that you're playing as someone undergoing Vivo exposure therapy, which I'll talk about more in the latter half of this video. Things like notes give context and insight into the locations you visit, but the overarching story of mental health betterment is told through gameplay and player choices. You play through the game and watch as the character you control faces their own inner demons and disorders while you also experience your own terror and stress with the abominations you're faced with getting past or killing. I should mention that through notes and certain gameplay sequences, it's implied that your character isn't the first one down here in the horrific different settings. Or more specifically, you aren't the first to undergo this kind of therapy. I don't believe this single character has all of the disorders I mentioned before, but you still experience them through the eyes of a single individual. Of course though, due to the psychological nature of the narrative, the actual story is shrouded with mystery. We don't know a lot about the player character, or how strong their internal motivations are for facing their fears, but cleverly and devilishly, you the player are given a simple and very effective motivation for facing these terrors. You have to rescue your dog. A dog in distress is a perfectly dark way to kick off a game like this. Not only would the average person be inclined to help a dog, but it's also the player character's service dog. I would no doubt jump down this sewer just as fast. The environments differ based on small story snippets and general progression, and they're all unnerving. As you play, you'll traverse through sewers, a subway, mine shafts, forest, mental institutions, and laboratories, all of which are abandoned and full of terrifying encounters. This brings us to the mechanics, which add a spark of creativity into a saturated genre. You're immediately introduced to directional audio as a mechanic, which helps guide you through maze-like tunnels and areas. While this is initially used to track your dog, it later on assists you with evading and avoiding enemies using sound. Speaking of sound, it's probably the strongest aspect of this game. The ambience is perfect, leaving you on edge throughout the entire game. It branches further than simple echoey spooky sounds. The ambience breaches into the realm of sound effects that actively invoke discomfort. Echoey tunnels, the dripping of sewer water, whispers from fragments of other tortured minds, glutteral sloshes coming from who knows where. For every monster, you're more likely to hear them before you see them. And the sounds they emit are disturbing to say the least. You really feel like you're being chased, whereas in other horror games a simple danger music cue would begin. Not to mention these sounds are entirely unique for each monster, and despite their archaic designs I found myself thinking quite often, yeah that thing probably would sound like that. The monsters never get stale either, they have a plethora of options and surprises to hunt you down. Some of them spawn in and begin attacking your ankles before you even notice them, some of them turn familiar objects into horrifying constructs and some of them continue chasing you when you would think you're safe in any other horror game. This includes a humanoid spirit that can phase through walls, 
and an arachnid-like abomination that can chase you up ladders. The game doesn't leave you to the mercy of these creatures, though. Uh, more often than not, you'll have to fight your way through them. It sports a very simple combat system involving a small assortment of melee weapons and guns, encouraging you to break out of your comfort zone even more to scavenge for ammunition. There isn't a ton of focus on these mechanics, though. I believe it's mostly there to force you to get up close and personal with the creatures. While I am on the topic, though, I should mention that I believe combat is the weakest part in the game. Some enemies can glitch through walls when they aren't supposed to, hitboxes are a little screwy, and it can be very unclear on when the game wants you to die during a combat encounter versus when it's just your own fault. But I don't really see combat as a big center point in this game, since as I've said, it seems to be just a segue to force you to be close to the enemies and see them in all their grotesque glory. Now, all of this is great and all, but it doesn't compare to what my real favorite part of this whole game is, and that's the heart that was put into it. This game is fully aware of what it is and takes full advantage of it. This is a horror game that elevates itself to the peak of its medium by showing a mastery of the typical tropes. Once again, it reminds me of Visage in that way. If you remember from the video that I made on it, I talked about how that game took almost every horror trope in the book and pulled them off really well. Lost in Vivo does something similar, but with horror games rather than general horror tropes. There's multiple endings, secret unlockable VHS tapes that act as secret levels, hidden game modes that you can play based on what time of the day it is and what your in-game options are, fake glitches that trick you into thinking the game is breaking, and easter eggs littered everywhere you look. It's peak indie horror, and the game knows it. Because the game has so much creative thought and energy put into it, I can genuinely say that not a single moment of it was dull for me. Things like notes in games are usually filler that explain things to you in the background of the unfolding events, but the notes in this game all have interesting stories and twists in them. Everything is just oozing with dark personality everywhere. Of course, as I've said, this game has multiple endings. Only one of them can really be considered good, and it's the ending that most people would get on a first playthrough. What's great about the endings is that the good one solidifies that the whole experience was a successful psychological journey, wasn't literal, and that the main character conquered their internal demons. But the secret ending, and supplemental hidden content, implies that the whole experience was real, and there's a dangerous, apocalyptic, otherworldly aspect surrounding the entire narrative. Whichever conclusion you lie on is up to you. The game easily offers up between 3 to 6 hours of gameplay depending on how deep you dig, and it comes in at only $12. If you're a horror fanatic, absolutely pick this up, and if you're just looking to get scared, this will definitely get the job done. I'd consider it a 4 out of 5. However, the video isn't over yet. I'd still like to dissect how this game conveys psychological horror so effectively, so that my thoughts on what I think good horror is are documented. So, let's talk about it. Before we continue, it should be noted that the game's namesake, Lost in Vivo, is referring to Vivo Exposure Therapy. This is a real form of psychological treatment that involves the patient being exposed to, and pushed, to directly face an object or situation that causes them anxiety, stress, or fear. So the title, Lost in Vivo, is referring to your character being lost in a perpetual state of facing terrifying and stressful things, and boy does that ring true. In practice, there are two different kinds of exposure therapy. One is named flooding, which involves rapid exposure to feared situations. The other is called systematic desensitization, which involves a gradual exposure with relaxation exercises when anxiety becomes too great. I'd say the game definitely captures the aspects of the flooding method, but of course in reality it portrays far less extreme methods than in the game. For example, there was a study done involving exposure therapy with patients who had a fear of flying. A virtual reality simulation was created that simulated flying in an airplane, and it appeared to be effective on 70% of patients. Of course, the portrayal of experiencing the treatment is exaggerated for this game, but I still find its inspiration interesting. But how does the game portray the ailments this treatment is being used for? Let's take a look. The game is first and foremost described as a horror game about claustrophobia. While there's of course more to it than that, the theme of claustrophobia can be found throughout all environments of the game, as it's what torments the protagonist the most. Small cramped tunnels, hallways, and rooms are in high supply, and monsters will often come running at you, backing you into a corner and forcing you to confront them with nowhere else to run. 
Not only that, but if you decrease the game's gamma to zero, then begin a new game, you'll enter a secret level. In this level, you're still playing as the protagonist, who states that they need to go home. This level is just a driving sequence with music playing over it, though there's two instances where you enter a tunnel. When you enter the tunnels, the music gets distorted, and you begin to see things that aren't there. The first tunnel also has a sign that reads, Now Leaving Safety. At the end of the game, you attack a brain you encounter three times. This is a manifestation of the protagonist's brain, and I'll talk more about it in a second. However, every time you kill it, an enemy named the Siren spawns and begins pursuing you through the tunnels. The unique thing about the Siren is that it must be killed, utilizing the environment rather than guns. The Siren takes up the entire space of a tunnel, being large in size, and attempting to corner you, much like the train enemies from earlier in the game. However, once you defeat it, so does the protagonist begin to conquer their claustrophobic tendencies. Throughout the game, you'll encounter notes written by someone experiencing signs of body dysmorphia. And judging from said notes, it seems like everyone around this note writer completely destroyed their self-esteem. The writer talks about how ugly they feel all the time, and how they want to escape this world of torment around them. The writer gets into a relationship, and gets pressured into trying to lose weight, which they feel is impossible despite their efforts. It's a short, tragic tale, and this note writer could be interpreted as the protagonist, though I don't think that completely matters. Later in the game, you approach a crossroads. There is a mirror in the center of the room, with two pictures on either side of it. The one on the left depicts a grey blur of a face, while the one on the right depicts a quote-unquote normal face, and you choose which hallway to go down. This ends up being a simple puzzle. If you choose the wrong path, you're forced to face an enemy and restart the puzzle once again. The solution becomes easy, though. You're meant to go down the hallway depicting the grey blur over and over again. Each time you do so, the grey picture becomes more clear, and the colored one becomes more distorted. At the end, the grey picture depicts a woman looking downwards. The picture is still grey, and the woman looks pretty depressed, but that picture is now coherent and depicts a real person, while the illustrated, normal-looking one from before is now completely distorted. I interpret this as a journey to this individual's betterment of how they perceive themselves. They compare themselves to this image of beauty, but as their perception of themselves improves, the false image erodes. This small section conveys a lot, with no words spoken, and turning the gamey concept of a hallway puzzle into a small story. The next section does something similar, though this time with bulimia. You're presented with an apple, a toilet, and an exit. There's nothing blocking the exit, but just going through without interacting with anything results in failure, and you have to restart the segment. If you eat the apple, bars appear over the exit. These bars don't disappear until you purge yourself of the apple you just ate. However, upon doing this, it still results in failure. I was stuck on this one for a while, but the solution is clever. You're meant to eat the apple, then walk through the bars to complete the puzzle, indicating that the bars are more of a mental barrier rather than a physical one. This is what I meant when I said the game still handles disorders with respect while keeping the game unsettling. It's clearly indicating that this person suffering from bulimia is experiencing real discomfort. They feel trapped in this cycle of eating and purging, and they feel like they can't escape into the outside world unless they get rid of what they've eaten. While it's definitely not as easy to get through as, say, walking through fake bars, it's still a clever way to portray betterment and progression in a video game. Towards the end of the game, you encounter a brain that speaks to you, as I've mentioned before. Upon inspecting the Steam Trading Card section, this entity is named Your Brain. This brain berates you and attempts to fill you with self-doubt right before you're about to complete your journey. I'm your identity. I'm your crutch. You used to cling to me like a parasite. I know you better than anyone, and I know you're weak. You'll come right back. This is only one of the few instances in which a character speaks to themselves in this tone throughout the game, though it is the only one that's voiced. What you experience, what you read in the notes, and the environment all give off an underlying tone of depression that keeps these individuals stuck in vivo exposure therapy. The environments are devoid of any friendly human life, you're really by yourself down here, and the game attempts to ask you what the point of moving forward is if all there is ahead are more monsters and fear. The answer to this, of course, is a cute dog, though of course the obstacles in this game would wear on anyone's mental health. The brain is the best example of this. While berating the player character, it also attempts to describe fear as a sort of zone of comfort, or a crutch that the character needs in order to function. 
But like all obstacles in the game, you improve by facing it head on, confronting the challenge, then moving forward. And that's everything I have on Lost in Vivo. I beat the game a while back and it's still floating around in my head, it's absolutely memorable and clearly has a lot of effort put into it. If you haven't already, you should check out my video on Visage as well. It handles progression in a similar way, taking you on a psychological journey through the character's mental states and experiences with a very haunted house. Besides that, thank you for watching, and I'll be back soon.